and changed constantly. So this bottleneck slide style I'm talking about, it's a perfect example. Now, it starts out as an old slave instrument called the diddly stick, a single stringed instrument that a slave could make out of anything, and then you would pluck a string and slide something up and down that string to change the pitch. By 1880, it's evolved to the point where uh, early blues musicians are using broken off glass bottlenecks and sliding them up and down the necks on guitars to change the string notes. Now, they worked as deckhands and roustabouts on the steamboats plying those rivers, and folks everywhere heard them playing that music when they were off at night. <laughs> And they love that sound. And they began to copy it. And it evolves. And it changes. And it spreads not over uh, just Illinois, but literally all around the world. And that's the story of Illinois Roots music in a nutshell. Now, this guitar I'm playing is a 1936 wood-bodied dobro that an old man up in Havana, Illinois, bought brand new. And I bought off of him years later when he was too old to play anymore. And again, classic example. It's this new instrument that they made trying to make music bigger and brighter and louder. Now, folks always ask how I got interested in this old music. So I better give you a little background on myself. The first thing you need to know is that I have not always been a folk musician. I actually began my career as an archaeologist. And I did that for about three years and decided that really wasn't what I wanted to do. So I gave it up and became a folk singer. <laughs> but I can honestly tell you it's the only job I could have possibly had where becoming a folk singer was a step up in working conditions and salary. <laughs> but in 1987, I was invited to do a project because of that archaeology background that would change my life. I was asked by the Illinois Arts Council to create a project documenting the last of the pre-radio generation of musicians alive in rural Illinois. Folks born before the days of television and radio even recorded music. And that's where I learned most of the music I'll share with you here today. I met incredible people with wonderful stories. Folks up in their 90s, as sharp as tacks. It was an incredible experience, one I really, really treasure. One of those folks was a 94-year-old man named Jesse Smith. He lived on U.S. Highway 24, right down at the bottom of what we call the Ripley Hill. And he taught me an old song that was very typical of a lot of music you heard in rural Illinois in our earlier days. Now, this is a song he told me he used to sing as a little boy going to the one-room schoolhouse. And he played it on a very interesting instrument. That one. Now, this instrument has a lot of names. They call it a Jews harp, jaw harp, mouth harp, frog fiddle, snoopy harp, Arkansas harp, gugaw, gilgaw, drum blah, or by the name I gave it when it almost took out my front teeth, the Tennessee tooth trasher. <laughs> so let me give you a little taste of this song that Jesse told me he sang all those years ago. Years later, I'd find out it was a, a variation of an old English folk song that was over 500 years old. Jesse called it Nickety. Nackety now. <laughs> I married my wife in the month of June. Nickety nackety now now now. I courted her home by the light of the moon. Nickety nackety megadum dackety willopty wallopty rustical quality. Nickety nackety now now now. You folks sing that. My wife in a lump weighs 300 pounds. Nickety nackety now now now. She sits on the chair, the thing it breaks down. Nickety nackety megadum dackety willopty wallopty rustical quality. Nickety nackety now now now. <laughs> She combs her hair but twice a year. Nickety nackety now 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 with every stroke it brought a tear. Nickety nackety negadun dackety willopty wallopty rustical quality. Nickety nackety now now now. <laughs> 
She bakes a pie and calls it mince. Nickety nackety now now now. I haven't seen the old cat since. Nickety nackety naked on dacrity willity wallity rustical quality. Nickety nackety now now now. <laughs> She churned the butter in Dad's old boot. Nickety nackety now now now, and for the dash she used her foot. Nickety nackety naked undacrity willity wallity rustical quality. Nickety nackety now now now. <laughs> The butter came out a grizzly gray. Nickety nackety now 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 the cheese grew legs and ran away. Nickety nackety naked undacrity willopty wallopty rustical quality. Nickety nackety now now now. The saddle and bridle are there on the shelf. Nickety nackety now 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 if you want any more go sing it yourself. Nickety nackety naked undacrity willopty wallopty rustical quality. Nickety nackety now. Now, now. <laughs> there you go, the Tennessee Tooth Trasher. And I just showed you why it got that name. This was a, an instrument every kid in Illinois used to, to play. And a matter of fact, Abraham Lincoln himself used to play. Pretty cool old instrument. Now, Jesse told me that folks would make music anywhere with anything as simple as a Jew's harp. Maybe a set of bones by the middle 1800s, harmonicas. It was an incredible, incredible experience talking to these folks. Now, as this project developed and I interviewed more and more people, I began to learn some of the songs that they were playing, like the one I just played for you. But then another thing happened that kind of surprised me. They had these stories about their life and times. And suddenly, I started to see some of those stories showing up in some of the songs I was writing. And my favorite of all involved an old man named Homer Biedenbender. Now, Homer Biedenbender was an old-time fiddle player, last of the old fiddle players in our section of Western Illinois. I went to interview him one rainy afternoon. And I remember it like it was yesterday. He took me out to this old tin shed out on US 24, and he sat me down, and he started to tell me about the old days. He told me he had played fiddle for every square dance in Brown County from about 1930 well into the 1960s. And he said folks would dance anywhere. All an old empty barn was perfect, or the one-room schoolhouse, to shove those desks aside and have at it. In town, an empty storefront or a church basement would work. Heck, he told me if you lived out in the country in a big old farmhouse, sometimes on a Friday or a Saturday night, you might hear a banging on your front door. And before you could even get there to open it up, half a dozen big burly men would come barging into your living room, unannounced and unexpected. They'd pick up your furniture. They'd carry it out and set it down in the front lawn. They'd come back in, roll up your carpets, set those down out in the front lawn as well. Then they'd come in one more time, walk right up to the owners of the house and say, we're having a dance here tonight. <laughs> well, you folks are invited too. <laughs> well, after a while, I got up my nerve and I asked him if he might play something for me. And you know, he'd just been waiting. He reached right up above his head into the rafters of that old shed. He brought down this beat up wooden box and he commenced to open it up and start tuning up an old black fiddle. Now, you know, folks, I love old instruments, so I had to check it out, you know, see what he had. And as I looked closer, I realized that fiddle hadn't been painted black at all. That fiddle had been carved out of black walnut lumber. Now, I'd never seen that before, so I asked him about it. He told me. He said right around 1930, he had taught himself how to play a fiddle on a borrowed instrument from a neighbor. But when it came time to return that fiddle to the rightful owner, he didn't have any cash money to buy one of his own. So 
He told me that it occurred to him that if he could teach himself how to play the fiddle, he, my God, could figure out how to build one. And that's the story of Roots Music in Illinois, too. Making do with what you got. He told me the story of that old walnut fiddle that afternoon as the rain came down on that tin shed. And just 10 days later, I got the word Homer passed away. When I heard the news, I remembered his story. And I wrote him this song. This is the walnut fiddle for Homer Biedenbeck. This old fiddle's made of walnut from a tree down by the road that must have stood one hundred years. Planted by my great-grandfather long ago when he first settled on this farm, sheltered it from harm. Last of three he set out all together in a row. Reaching up into the heavens Like a hand outstretched to God It stood the years All the bitter tears Hanging down across that highway Folks would pass They'd brush the branches And they'd scatter the nuts Those old Model A cars would crush Every autumn one old weathered man Gather them up into a batter Ah, oh, but then one day the prairie sky turned dark and mean And soon the winds began to scream and howl We hid beneath the staircase as the thunder shook the ground When it passed that ancient tree was down I saw the boy Carved the body, shaved the neck, I turned these tuning pegs by hand. No, it ain't grand. But pull that bow across the strings and you'll hear the tones of cool, clear streams and whippoorwills in rolling hills. Hundred years of winter snow and summer rain. from its grave Ain't much to look at it's just an old black fiddle sitting here with strings of rust, all caked with rosin dust. But if you need to remember who you are and where you come from, just pick up that bow. Ah, she'll let you know. She'll sing of open prairie skies and old This old fiddle's made of walnut from a tree that must have stood 100 years. Walnut fiddle. I will tell you that after I finished that song, I went out and found Homer's burial plot and I played it for him. So I hope he enjoyed it. <laughs> now, in Illinois, guitarists really didn't come into popularity till much later. Fiddles were important, and trust me, you don't want to hear me play fiddle. But this instrument, this was very popular in our state. Of course, this is a banjo, and this is an old open back, skinhead, gut stringed, and yes, 
exactly what you think it is, boiled, twisted cat intestines, <laughs> banjo. Now, this one doesn't have real gut strings on it. It's got nylon strings, but it has that old time sound, which is very plunky, in fact, compared to a modern bluegrass style banjo. Now, the banjo has quite a history. It evolved from an old African instrument called a banjar or a kora, and Thomas Jefferson himself speaks about it around 1780. By about 1850, they've evolved to the point they look pretty much like this. And right about that time, they're becoming the most popular instrument in the entire country. Now, this early music that we're having in our state usually is very primitive sounding. Most of it came out of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, as did many of our earliest pioneers. So let me give you a quick taste of what I mean. There is a song that really kind of sums that up. It's called The Cumberland Gap, which, by the way, was that mountain pass that almost every pioneer into Illinois had to go through. Well, I lay down, boys, take a little nap, all going down to the Cumberland Gap. Cumberland Gap, Cumberland Gap. Hey, we're all going down to the Cumberland Gap. Baby who calls me Pap, Cumberland Gap, Cumberland Gap. Hey, we're all going down to the Cumberland Gap. Well, now me, my wife, and my wife's Pap, we all live in the Cumberland Gap, Cumberland Gap, Cumberland Gap. The Cumberland Gap. Now that's very typical of really early Appalachian style music. Uh, it's primarily string band music, and there's not a whole lot of song structure to it per se. But that's the kind of music you would have heard in the 1830s, maybe the 1840s. But by the end of the 1840s, everything is changing. And right here in Illinois as well. There's a number of factors coming to a critical mass. First of all, the Industrial Revolution is taking hold. And all of a sudden, musical instruments, pianos, little organs, banjos, can be mass produced and be sold much more affordably. The next thing that's going on is the rise of uh, large metropolitan centers that provide a base for this business. And then the third thing are new transportation systems, especially the steamboat. The steamboat changes everything. The cost of shipping goods from the East Coast to St. Louis drops by a factor of 200%. And as a result of that, you are getting a, a group of people with extra income. You're having access to all kinds of new music. And we get the beginning of popular American music for the very first time. It happens in 1848 when one man writes a song that changes everything. Stephen Foster. Stephen Foster writes a song you still know today. And it's the first hit song Ever. Not just around the country, but literally, this song is known in completely around the world. Now that song is Oh Susanna, and not only is it played on the banjo, it actually talks about the banjo in the song. So let me give you a taste of how Oh Susanna would have sounded on an old-time banjo in 1848. Well, I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. 
And I'm going to Louisiana, my true love for to see. There ain't all night the day I left, and the weather, it was dry. And the sun's so hot, I froze to death, Susanna, don't you cry. incredibly popular. Lincoln's best friend, Ward Hill Lehman, used to play one. Matter of fact, Abraham tried to get his son Robert to learn. He wasn't interested. The song became so popular, though, that it was adopted as the official theme song of the California Gold Rush. Now, they made up their own verses to this song, and a few of those still survive. Here's one of them right here. Well, I come from Salem City with a wash pan on my knee. And I'm gone to California, gold mines for the sea. I scrape the mountains clean, my boys, I'll drain the rivers dry. Now a pocket full of rocks bring home, oh brothers, don't you cry. Oh, Susan, don't you cry for me. Cause I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Pan on my knee. <laughs> Gotta say, I really like those old time banjo sound. Now, when I was interviewing these old musicians, one of my favorites was a man named Lawrence Royer. Lawrence lived in Bader, Illinois, and he was about 96 years old when I interviewed him. And he was kind of a renaissance man in many ways. He, he knew all the old time life skills, like when to go hunting ginseng, when to peel the hickory bark off the trees to make those woven hickory seats. You didn't do it when the sap was rising, they'd crack. He was a primitive painter, and he painted all kinds of scenes about life when he was a young man, turn of the century, and he was a musician, he built and played hammered dulcimers and knew lots of old songs. Now, music ran in families in those days. It wasn't something that like, we take for granted today. You know, we listen to music as background. In those days, it was participatory. And he told me the story about how his mother learned to sing. Now. She was going to the one-room schoolhouse in Bader, Illinois, back in the 1880s. And at that time, all the local families would chip in a, le a little extra money, and they would hire a woman to come in and teach singing to the kids. Now, this particular moment in time was, is unique because as I'm interviewing him, he, he gets up and walks out of the room. And all of a sudden, he comes back holding four very old brown crank crackled pieces of paper, and he hands them to me. And as I look on one of them, across the top in that beautiful old-fashioned Spencerian writing, it says, Bader, Illinois, February 18th, 1884, Miss Mary Lancaster. That was, that was his mother. Now, she had written out the words to every single song they had learned in that singing school. But then, Lawrence started to sing them to me. 
Now, when you're collecting old music, this is the holy grail moment. Something so un unusual and unique about to disappear from time, and you manage to grab it and hold on to it and share it with folks. Uh, I, I learned several of the songs off of that sheet. I want to do one of them for you right now. This was a song Lawrence sang to me uh, called Down by the Gate. And I would later find out, even if, though it was a very obscure song, it had actually been published in St. Louis two years before. And people up in Bader, Illinois, were using it in a singing school just two short years later. My sweetheart's a sly little fairy. Her age it is just 17. The parents think she is too airy. But a sweeter girl I've never seen. At night she steals out from the cottage. Her mother cries after her key. She answers, Mama, I'm not going far. I'll just go as far as the gate. I'll just go as far as the gate. Dear Ma, just down by the old garden gate. The moon is so bright and it's such a fine night I love to stand here by the gate Of course, by the gate I am waiting And sweet are the words that we say While outside the old folks are debating the price of the next load of hay. They sometimes call softly for Katie. She answers, dear Ma, tis not late. There's no sign of the storm, and the night is so warm. I love to stand here by the gate. I'll just go as far as the gate, dear Ma, just down by the old garden gate. The moon is so bright and it's such a fine night I love to stand here by the gate They say we're too young to be married Ah, oh, but with them I do not agree Love's message to Katie I've carried and a kiss was the answer for me. We'll wander away by the moonlight. Much longer we surely can't wait. One night by and by to the Parsons we'll fly. When Katie comes down by the gate. I'll just go as far as the gate. Dear Ma, just down by the old garden gate. The moon is so bright and it's such a fine night I love to stand here by the gate And I will share one thing with you. As the father of a 19-year-old daughter, this song proves that nothing has changed much in the last 120 years or so. <laughs> now, when I was researching these old musicians and, and trying to contact them and interview them, I, I came across the writings of a woman named Annabelle Colvin. She'd already passed away by the time I heard about her, but she had been a, a resident of Beardstown, Illinois, in her middle and older years. But before that, she had been a river rat. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is not an insult. Uh, a river rat is actually an honorific title. It was uh, a name that was given to those folks that lived and worked exclusively on the rivers. And there was a whole subculture of those people back in the 1800s. Annabelle was one of them. She was born and raised in a houseboat on the Illinois River. And her family had lived that way for generations. Now, in her book, Annabelle spoke about the time 
Her father, who also lived in a houseboat, met her mother. Now, he had been sent down to a place called Hendry's Landing, where there was a floating grocery store to pick up provisions. And as he's taking that boat around that final bend coming up on the, the store, he begins to hear the sound of a young girl singing off in the distance. And she's singing, Oh, my darling Nellie Gray, they have taken you away. I'll never see my darling anymore. Well, he got real quiet, and he rode that boat around that final bend, and sure enough, there she was, sitting on the roof of that floating grocery store, just singing off to the birds in the trees as the sunlight filtered down on her golden blonde hair. Well, now, Annabelle said he was, he was just hooked immediately, dead set in love. She also mentioned that the young woman did not share those feelings. She said it took nearly a, a year of hard courting before she'd given the time of day, but ultimately he did win her affections. And this song, Darla Nellie Gray, became their special song. <laughs> In that long green valley of that old Kentucky shore Where I wild many happy hours away Just sitting and a singing by the little cabin door Where lived my darling Nellie Gray Oh my darling Nellie Gray, they have taken you away I'll never see my darling anymore They've taken you to Georgia for to work your life away. Now you're gone from that old Kentucky shore. Now when the moon was in the heavens and the stars were shining bright, I would take my darling Nellie Gray. We'd float down the river in our little birch canoe while my banjo so sweetly I would play. One day I went to find her, but she's gone, the neighbors say, for the white man has bound her in his chain. They've taken her to Georgia for to work her life away as she toils in the cotton and the cane. Oh, my darling Nellie Gray, they have taken you away. I'll never see my darling anymore. They've taken you to Georgia for to work your life away. Now you're gone from that old Kentucky shore. Here we go. are getting blinded and I cannot see the day. Hark, there's someone knocking at your door. I hear the angels calling and I see my Nellie Gray. Fare thee well to my old Kentucky shore. My darling Nellie Gray, up in heaven there they say, they'll never take you from me anymore. I'm coming, coming, coming while the angels clear the way. Fare thee well to my old Kentucky shore. wasn't just a private thing. Now, everybody played and sang something, and it didn't matter if you were any good or not. But there were community involvements too. And nothing was more important in a small community or a rural area than the old time square dance. Now, I have an instrument here I want to share with you that would have been played at one of those. But while I grab it, 
here's a, a word from, from Garrick. I hope you're enjoying tonight's program. We would like to acknowledge the generosity of the donors whose names you see listed on the screen. It is only through the generosity of the donors that we are able to continue to bring quality programming such as Chris Valillo. We'd like to invite you to join the donors. You can donate by clicking the link at the bottom of the screen or the link on our website. And now, please welcome back Chris Valillo. So what I have here is an old hammered dulcimer. This is an instrument that goes back thousands of years. It's a trapezoidal shaped box. It's about four inches thick. And across the top of this one are about 47 steel strings. Now here in Western Illinois, dulcimer were one of the most popular instruments around. We were a real hotbed, not only of playing, but of building. And a lot of them were just homemade instruments. One of the folks I interviewed was a woman named Genevieve Meffert down in Naples, Illinois. And she was the daughter of one of the best known dulcimer players around, Chet Skiles. And she talked about how music was played and shared in those days, how important the square dances were. And of course, being on the Illinois River, she talked about how sometimes the steamboats would come into town, maybe on a Friday or a Saturday night. They might offload their passengers and cargo, but then they'd pick up a local string band and they would take folks out on a late night dance under the starlight. Now, a hammered dulcimer would have been a welcome addition to any string band in those days. And one of the songs you might have heard on that cruise was an old time waltz tune called Midnight on the Water. Beautiful sound an instrument, right? Now, as you can see, I'm playing it with a pair of wooden hammers and mallets. It has that sharp, bright, ringing sound folks describe as a cross between a harp and a piano. And the dulcimer I just played for you is a really special one. It was built right here in Western Illinois, built by a man named Daniel Van Antwerp. And he was kind of unusual because he actually built dulcimers as part of the way he made his living. Now, this one, when I first got it, didn't look anything like it does right now. See, it had been left out in a barn for about 30 years. <laughs> and friends, that was a working barn filled with living, breathing, <clears throat> working animals. And as a direct result of that, it was encrusted in a disgusting layer of filth that, that I can't even begin to describe in polite society. 
But I was able to, to clean it up, restore it, and bring it back to life, which I just love to do. Now, when I was interviewing old musicians, I found a square dance caller named Glenn Hanning, and he told me that in Illinois, the most popular dance tune of all, from about 1870, well into the 1920s, was an old tune called Golden Slippers. So let me give you a taste of that right now, and you can hear what a more up-tempo dance tune would sound like. Now this particular dulcimer I just played was built in 1880. Doesn't sound too bad for being 140 years old, does it? Alrighty. Now things began to change come the turn of the century. New things are happening, and one of the most important of all is radio. Radio is going to exponentially change the game. Now all of a sudden, someone living on a farm outside of Jacksonville, Illinois, they could hear music that was being played live in Chicago or Nashville, or, or New York City. I'll tell you what, it, it literally changes everything. All sorts of new music is heard, all sorts of new sounds combine. And one of the most important uh, sources of radio is the WLS Barn Dance up in Chicago. Now, Sears and Roebuck creates WLS Radio and the National Barn Dance. As a matter of fact, the station logo, WLS, that's based on Sears' uh, actual uh, pitch, the world's largest store. Now, the National Barn Dance goes on to be the biggest Opry-style show in the nation. Bigger than the Grand Old Opry, bigger than the Louisiana Hayride, and it will dominate the airways well into the 1940s and 50s. They had all of the biggest stars of the day on there. Gene Autry, Patsy Montana, Lulabell and Scotty, and one man named Bradley Kincaid. Bradley Kincaid was a member of the original cast, and he had been born in Kentucky, and then every summer he would go back down to Kentucky and hunt out old songs and share them with the folks on the radio. He was one of their most popular acts. Well, I've got a song that he released in the 1930s that we know for sure dates at least back to the 1890s. I want to share this one with you right now. 
This is a song that will tell you a little bit about some of the things you might find in some of the foods you might eat and what those things might do to you. This is called Some Little Bug Is Gonna Get Ya. In these days of indigestion, it is oftentimes a question as to what to eat and what to leave alone. For each microbe and bacillus has a different way to kill us, and in time they'll always claim us for their own. Now there are germs of every kind in any food that you can find in the market or up on the bill of fare. Drinking water is just as risky as the so-called deadly whiskey, and it's often a mistake to breathe the air. For some little bug is going to find you someday. Some little bug will creep behind you someday. Then he'll call for his bug friends. All his trouble hands. A little bug is going to find you someday. Now the inviting green cucumber gets most everybody's number, while the sweet corn has a system all its own. And though the radish seems nutritious, its behavior is quite vicious, and a doctor will be coming to your home. Now eating lobster cooked or plain is only flirting with domain, while an oyster sometimes has a lot to say. And those clams we eat and chowder make the angels sing the louder, for they know that we'll be with them right away. Now when cold storage vaults I visit, I can only say what is it makes poor mortals fill their systems with such stuff. Now for breakfast, prunes are dandy, if a stomach pump is handy, and a doctor can be found quite soon enough. Now eat a plate of fine pig's knuckles, friends the headstone cutter chuckles, while the grave digger makes a note upon his cup. Eat that lovely red bologna, why you'll wear a wood kimono as your relatives start scrapping about your stuff. For some little bug is going to find you someday, some little bug will creep behind you someday. Eating juicy sliced pineapple makes the sextant dust the chapel, some little bug is going to find you someday. Now all those crazy foods we fix will close us cross the river Styx, start us climbing up the Milky Way. And those meals we heat in courses need a hearse and six black horses, so before they eat some people always pray. Now luscious grapes breed appendicitis and the juice leads to gastritis, so there's only death to greet us either way. Fried liver's nice, but mind you, friends will soon ride close behind you, and the papers then will have nice things to say. For some little bug is going to find you someday. Some little bug will creep behind you someday. Eating juicy sliced pineapple makes the sextant dust the chapel. Some little bug is going to find you someday. Eat some sauce, they call it chili. On your breast, they'll place a lily. Some little bug is going to find you someday. on that song. Now the other thing that's happening at this point in time is recorded music. And one of the biggest stars of the era is a man named Jimmy Rogers. Jimmy Rogers is a, a huge hit and he breaks a lot of barriers. He's the first guy to combine the sounds of country music and blues creating an entire new genre, country blues. Now, he's also the first guy to incorporate slide guitar into country music, and it happens in 1929. Jimmy was in a recording studio, 
And he needed one more song, made up this song I'm going to play for you, The Traveling Blues. And while he's there, he happened to know that the Hawaiian slide guitar players were selling a whole bunch more records than anybody else. And there happened to be somebody in the studio that played Hawaiian slide. So he picked him up and put him into the session. And for the very first time, slide guitar and country music come together. And it never leaves from that point forward. This is a song that started it off for Jimmy Rogers, The Traveling Blues. Jimmy Rogers. A lot of folks know him as the Yodelin Brakeman, and that's for two reasons. Well, the first, of course, is that for a short period of his life, he actually did work as a brakeman on a railroad line. But the other reason is that in every single Jimmy Rogers song ever written, you are required by the laws of God and country music 
to yodel. So I would like to apologize right now for what's about to happen, because this could go either way, friends. All right, here we go. <clears throat> yodel, little, little lady, yodel, little lady. All right. <laughs> That was a lot better than it could have been, believe me. <laughs> now I've got time for just a couple of more songs and I was asked specifically to make sure I included a song from the Carter family. And I'm happy to do that. I love the music of Mother Maybell and AP and Sarah Carter. And again, it's very typical of this same sort of progression. They're hunting up old songs. They're changing them. They're making them evolve into modern songs or shortening them down to three minutes because that's all the time they've got for records. And they are creating a whole new style. They are literally making what becomes country music out of thin air. Now, I want to do a song that would become their very biggest hit of all. It's a song that they uh, it was originally written in 1898 by a woman named Ada Blankhorn. And Sarah's cousin taught it to the Carter family, and Sarah brought it into the band. Mother Mabel added that fancy guitar picking she did. That Carter family style. And it became such a big hit that quite literally every single show they ever played after that song was released, they had to perform it. This is a, a song I'm sure you'll recognize, and I'll pick a little Mother, Mother Mabel's fancy picking style. This is Keep on the Sunny Side of Life. There's a dark and a stormy side of life. There's a bright and a sunny side too. Though we meet with the darkness and strife, sunny side we also may view. So keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side. Keep on the sunny side of life. It will help us every day. It will brighten all our way if we keep on the sunny side of life. the storm and its fury broke today crushing hopes that we cherish so dear storms and clouds will in time fade away the sun again will shine bright and clear so keep on the sunny side always on the sunny side Keep on the sunny side of life. It will help us every day. It will brighten all our way. If we keep on the sunny side of life. All right, I'll pick a little guitar like Mother Maybell used to do. Every day it will brighten all our way if we keep 
on the sunny side of life. Words to live by. All right. Well, first of all, I want to tell you how much fun I've had. I've loved sharing these old songs with you, particularly singing to the people in the very region we, we collected them from. And I'm going to wind up with one last song. When I was interviewing old musicians, I, I met this man, Lawrence Royer. That's the fellow that I learned when Katie comes down by the gate from. And the very first time I met Lawrence, I went to interview him. Now that morning I got up like I normally do. I, I had my cup of coffee, I turned on the news, and it just so happened. That was the day they announced that they had actually located the, the shipwreck of the Titanic. And we saw the first ghostly images of that boat sitting on the bottom of the ocean. Now, it was big news in rural Illinois, I'll tell you what. I was living in Rushville at the time. Everybody was talking about it. And that afternoon, I go to interview Mr. Royer outside of Bader, out in the country. Now, they always tell you that when you're going to interview somebody new, you, you need to kind of build a rapport before you start the recording. So I was setting up the recording equipment, just kind of talking to him, and I mentioned, uh, say, Lawrence, have you heard about the Titanic? Oh, well, he, he got all excited, and his eyes got bright and shiny, and he told me he knew everything there was to know about the Titanic because he had been 22 when the boat sank. Now, he went on to tell me that in those days, my folks always wrote songs about big disasters. Not only as a way to share the news of the day, but as a way to make just another interesting song. Now, he told me that he learned this song about a year after the Titanic sank. He taught it to me. Now I'm going to teach it to you. Before I do, though, I want to tell you one thing he said, which never really left me. He said, I never dared to dream that I might live long enough that I would ever see the Titanic again. And, you know, I thought about that. You know, here was a man that was born in the days of the horse and buggy. He saw the rise of the automobile, the telephone, recorded music, radio, television. He lived through two world wars, saw the ship that could not sink, sink on its maiden voyage. He saw us put a man on the moon, and he lived long enough to see pieces of that boat eventually being brought back up again. And I thought to myself, wow, I don't think anyone will ever live a life that's going to cover such an incredible range of change. At any rate, this is a song he taught me. It's an old kind of singing song called a call and answer song. And if I was with you tonight, I would be having all of you join in and sing along with me. But you can do it wherever you're at. And it's really easy. I have to do most of the work. I'm going to sing the verses. But when I get to the chorus, I'll sing the first line to you, and that's me calling out to you. And then you just repeat it to me like this. It was sad. And you go, it was sad. All right? So try that with me. I'm going to do it. I'll do my part first, and then I'll do your part. It was sad. It was sad. There you go. Then I go, so sad. And you do the same thing. So sad. But the next one's a little trickier. I go, wasn't it sad when that great ship went down? And then you'd all have to sing, to the bottom of the sea. So, if you want to join in and help me out on this song, wherever you're at, please do. This is the way my 96-year-old friend, Lawrence Royer, used to sing the sinking of the Titanic. It was on one Sunday morning, just around 12 o'clock, when that great Titanic bow began to reel and rock. People on board began to cry, saying they was afraid to die. It was sad when that great ship went down. All right, get ready now. Here we go. It was sad. It was sad. So sad. So sad. 
Wasn't it sad when that great ship went down to the bottom of the husbands and wives and little children lost their lives? It was sad when that great ship went down. Well, now they built that ship Titanic just to sail the ocean blue. And they thought they had a ship that the water wouldn't get through. But God, with the power in his hand, said that great boat would not stand. And it was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad, so sad. Wasn't it sad when that great ship went down? Husbands and wives and little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down. Here we go. Now they swung the lifeboats out o'er the dark and the raging sea As the band out on the deck struck up near my God to thee Little children screamed and cried as the waves swept o'er the side It was sad when that great ship went down It was sad, so sad Wasn't it sad when Great ship went down. Husbands and wives, and little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down. Oh, it was sad, so sad. Wasn't it sad when that great ship went down? Husbands and wives, and little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down. <laughs> All righty, there you go. Now I'm going to take just a moment to get my earbuds reconnected so I can talk with with uh, Jeremy and answer any of the questions you folks might have. Well, well, we thank go. you, Chris, for a uh, wonderful performance. Um, and I apologize to everyone earlier. I uh, realized I forgot to hit one button. And so you actually didn't hear me speak earlier. Uh, <laughs> the wonders of technology. I here. My earbuds had died. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm looking forward here. We've had some questions coming in and uh, looking forward to asking Chris a, a few things here. Um, and if you have more, please please keep sending them in. Um, well, we've got you in this shot, Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. We actually had someone want, wondering if you could tell us about the guitar that you were playing when you sang the Jimmy Rogers song. It'd be the one with the big metal resonator. <laughs> okay. The one I just ended with, this one. I believe this, so. Yeah. This is a 1936 wood-bodied Dobro or resonator guitar. Now, if you've never seen one before, the big shiny metal disc isn't the hubcap from a, from a 1940 DeSoto just nailed onto a regular guitar. It's a cover plate for an invention they made in 1926 called a resonator. Now, a resonator sits underneath that cover plate. It's a thin sheet of aluminum, about as thick as a soda pop can, and it's been shaped in a giant stamping press, so it's cone-shaped. Matter of fact, it looks exactly like the speaker in your television or your stereo does, and it does exactly what a speaker does. It makes the guitar louder. Uh, only it doesn't use electricity. The vibrations of the strings are, uh, are transmitted into that cone, and it acts exactly like a speaker. So it's, uh, it's quite loud. I'll show you here in a second. Now, 
Now, they invented this in 1926, and it was two brothers out in California, uh, and they were Czechoslovakian immigrants called the Dopiero brothers. And they took those two words, their name and their brother, and they created a brand, Dobro, D-O-B-R-O. Now, Dobro has become kind of like the generic name for any resonator guitar, um, like Kleenex has become the generic name for any uh, facial tissue. Now, this guitar is perfect for that bottleneck slide style I was playing, where I use the sawed-off top of a glass bottle, in this case, Merlot wine. <laughs> Hard to get a straight long neck anymore, you know. I put it on my little finger, and I'm actually playing in an open tuning. When I strum the guitar, I'm playing an E major chord, and I use the bottleneck slide to slide up and down the neck to change both the chords and to play individual notes. And it's a style that dates all the way back to blues musicians. As I mentioned in the beginning of the show, it evolved out of an old uh, slave instrument called the diddly stick and was created by the blues musicians and brought all around the country. Now, this is a, a wood-bodied version of that. I actually have a metal-bodied one here I did not use today. But just so you can see the difference, there is one that is actually made out of sheet steel. And it's a beautiful design. And instead of having a single 12-inch cone in it, this has three 6-inch cones. And it has a slightly different sound. Even louder. And this was actually made by the Dopiero brothers after they left Dobro and created national guitars. So there you go, a nickel tour on slide guitar and resonators. So I have to ask, Chris, yeah. I know I know you said uh, the, the type of bottle that you're using currently. Do you have yep. a preference on the type of bottle or the vintage that you end up using? <laughs> Jeremy, you know me only too well already. <laughs> so. Believe it or not, I know way too much about empty wine bottles. Um, <laughs> the best slides for the style I play are long, straight necks. That's about three inches of straight glass. Uh, and it's really hard to find a bottle with that long and straight of a neck anymore. Uh, two varieties of wine generally have that. Uh, Pinot Grigio tends to have long, straight necks. And in this case, Merlot. You know, it's the style of that bottle for that particular variety. Uh, I have also found that a lot of these uh, little dessert wines that come in those really skinny bottles with real tall necks, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those can make really good slides too. And, uh, and I cut these myself. Uh, I have a glass cutter where I, I cut them off, snap it, and then sand the edges smooth so that there are no sharp edges. But I'll see if I can get a little closer shot there for you. Probably hard to see against my background. Oops. Here, let me Wrong move button. that out of the way. There we go. <laughs> there we go. But it's actually the sawed-off top. Now, you see the two dots on the end? Yep. Uh, there are seams there. So I try to avoid those. And you'll see me doing that every once in a while when I'm playing. I'm trying to spin it away from the seams. Other way, it makes Got a big it. scratchy noise. Got it. Yeah, I, just, I figured I'd ask since uh, you've got some experience there and someone yeah. may be looking to make their own glass slide. <laughs> well, and, you know, they, they make all kinds of slides now. But when I first started playing bottleneck, you had to make your own. Uh, and to this day, nobody really makes one like I use, so I still continue to make them. There you go. I and the wine. <laughs> I was going to say, you get a nice little drink out of it, too. So. Yes. <laughs> i got to tell you, though, um, my very favorite bottleneck slide was a cobalt blue bottle, and it was a terrible wine, really sweet and syrupy. <laughs> and I gave it to some friends, and I sat there with them and made them drink the wine, and then I took the bottle home. There you go. There you go. Um I have a, another question um, as far as instruments go. Yeah. And do you have a favorite one that you tend to play the most? And I see you've got plenty of different guitars around you, um, yes. other stringed instruments. Do you have a preference, a favorite that you like? My absolute favorite is the Black Callings. This one I, that I played several tunes on. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a guitar that is 
an exact replica of a, an OM Martin from the 1930s. It was built in Austin, Texas, and it is the best instrument I've ever laid my hands on. If there's a note out of tune, if there's something not right with the playing, it is my fault. You can play this guitar perfectly. <laughs> uh, that's the one I play most for, for standard style. Uh, the wood body dobro is the one I play most for slide guitar. Um, but I tend to bring both resonators because the, the green guitar is in open D tuning and the, the wood body, it is open E tuning. And uh, old guitars like I tend to, to, to like don't like to be retuned a lot. Uh, a full major step would be, it wouldn't hold uh, pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take it 10 minutes or so to settle back in. So I just Got bring it. along extra guitars. All right. Um, had another question come in here. Um, I'm going to throw this one up on the screen as well. Uh, okay. What would you say is the greatest contribution to later popular music from one or more of artists and styles that you shared tonight? Well, um, first of all, Bottleneck Slide goes into uh, bluegrass music as the dobro. It goes into early country music as the steel guitar. Uh, by the 50s, it evolves into the pedal steel guitar. In the 70s and 80s, slide guitar becomes a major component in rock music. Uh, you know, think about the Eagles. Uh, you know, think about Johnny Winter. Um, you know, all of these roots musical styles blend into that. So certainly slide guitar is one of those. Um, the hammer dulcimer that I played, John Lennon used one on Double Fantasy, his last album. Uh, you know, these instruments show up in unique places because they have, each one has its own particularly special sound and tone. And depending upon the piece of music and the mood you're trying to create, uh, that can very easily be exactly what you need. Uh, which is one of the reasons I just love them, especially some of the less expensive ones, because uh, as I was exploring old recordings and listening to early blues music, it always had that really kind of old timey sound to it. And I always thought it was the recordings until I got my hands on some of those old guitars and I realized that's how they sound. You know, most of these guys weren't playing expensive instruments. They're playing Sears and Robux or Stellas, you know, fairly inexpensive instruments that had that kind of plunky, chunky sort of sound. All right. Um, now, th this question comes directly from me. As, as a percussionist, I am used to dealing with raw animal skins to mm -hmm. put on drums and things like that. And you brought up on the banjo um, yes. that typically there's a skin head on it. Yep. Is, there, is there a preference as to what type of animal that, that's used for the banjo? Or was now, there one originally? Originally, it was something uh, I have heard uh, a number of things where p people talked about things like possums uh, or um, uh, you know, similar small road raccoon or something. Um, a lot of those would have been homemade instruments and they're, they're just taking a raw hide themselves and making it. Uh, when I bought this banjo, the original skin head was torn and was no good. So I had it replaced and what you buy now is a calf skin head. Uh, and it's raw hide, uh, you soak it, get it good and wet, stretch it over the, the ring, tighten it down and as it dries it, it tightens up. But as a percussionist, I'm sure you understand how humidity can affect these oh, things. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, and I've had my actual fair share of actually shaving a skin to, before putting it on, too. Sure. Which is the also thinner. quite an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah, the thinner the skin is, the sharper and brighter the tone is. Mm -hmm. the, the calf skin I put on here is actually thicker than the original skins would have been. And I can really tell a difference between this one and an old banjo I've got that still has the original skin head on it. Now, and I, I have a, tell you, I, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Kurt, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to tell you a little story about the first time I ever did a recording. I was at Champaign, Illinois, and I was using a very tiny little banjo uh, uke, a four string banjo about about the size of a, a oh, you know, a small saucer. And um, it had a skin head on it and it was August. And uh, the, kin, the skin heads absorb moisture and stretch out constantly. So every time we'd take a take, we'd bring out a Bic lighter and heat the skin to dry it out, to tighten it up again, then we'd take another take. <laughs> but that's just the nature of these old instruments, you know. They have their own 
idiosyncrasies. Well, and it seems, um, you know, very folksy as far as kind of the origin of that instrument, especially when you talked about how the original strings tended to be cat intestines. Um, yep. Probably not something that we would think about using nowadays. No. These are nylon gut strings on here now, which are <laughs> nylon strings made to emulate the feel and the sound of those old gut strings. Um, I have uh, had instruments that I bought that were antiques that still had the old original gut strings, and they stretch and they snap and they don't last, um, but they do sound just like that. So this is a big improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's great to see, um, especially with these instruments and what you're doing as well, that you're able to continue the, the history of these instruments and these tunes. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned, you've mentioned tunes, you know, from hundreds of years ago <laughs> that are, you know, have evolved slightly, but still really. Yet. Well, you know, uh, back around 2010, I was involved with the Smithsonian Institution and they were traveling an exhibit on roots music. And I was the Illinois scholar for that exhibit. And one of the things they specifically said was that roots music is the soundtrack of the melting pot of America. And that's exactly what it is. You can hear these influences from different cultures and different times all the way up into modern music. You know, you can, you can look at a, a guy like Jimmy Rogers, who takes country music, but does it to a blues pattern, just a straight one, four, five, um, singing country kind of melodies, singing country kind of themes, but using that blues format. Uh, and you see this time and time again, uh, as one style of music influences another. So I love the fact that these old instruments can kind of take you back to one of those points and, and give you a, a taste of how it, how it might have been. Absolutely. Now, this is another question that I had come had kind of thought about, um, you know, when I was getting ready to meet with you some more and have this chance yeah. to chat. Um, I know you also are into restoring some older instruments as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, what would be an, one of the instruments that you've either owned or restored that has had a huge, you know, history behind it? Well, let's see. Um, I have an instrument that I, uh, I didn't pull out today, um, simply because I have, I have enough of them out. <laughs> uh, not that there's ever too many guitars. But in Illinois, between about 1880 and 1950, um, you have the world's biggest stringed musical instrument center in Chicago. Uh, there are people like Washburn, Lion and Healy, Regal, Harmony, Kay, uh, Stromberg, Vossenet, you know, all of these gigantic corporations, but you also have some very small, important builders. And one of them were the Larson brothers in Chicago, uh, two Swedish brothers, um, and they create uh, new styles of guitars. They're the first guys that really capitalize on X bracing and designing guitars specifically for steel strings. And they make their instruments bigger than uh, most other people do. They're making guitars that are almost as big as modern day dreadnoughts long before Martin and other builders are. And um, this is the guitar of choice, by the way, that was played by Patsy Montana and Gene Autry and all of the stars on the barn dance because they were Chicago builders. But mainly because the guitars are louder than other guitars of the time. So I have one of those instruments uh, which I take out on, on rare occasions, and I was able to restore it back into playing condition. Uh, awesome. That's that's perhaps my favorite vintage instrument. That's awesome. Um, would you say, because it, it seems like Illinois, um, you know, especially as you've kind of gone through some of your your findings and, um, you know, you're, you're digging through and, and finding all these, these great pieces, these great people, these great stories, um, you know, what would, I guess, what would you say is or makes Illinois feel like it's such a hub for all of these different music scenes and these different stories that are coming out of it? Uh, to me, it's, it goes back to that, that basic theme of Illinois was such a cosmopolitan state. We're having 
so many influences coming in and, and blending and evolving. And um, for instance, country music ends up being centered in Nashville, uh, ultimately, but it didn't start out in Nashville. Chicago is a huge country music force. Um, it was also a major ethnic music area, early center for recording. Uh, and it's not so much that Illinois dominates any other of these styles as it influences every single one of them. And it comes down to that blending effect of new people, new ideas, new musics coming together as our state develops and, and evolves. And, you know, Illinois ends up being the center of our country, the transportation hubs of the national roads and the railroads, Chicago, you know, the second city. Uh, it, is, it is a major industrial and commercial center for the nation, and it touches everywhere, especially through radio. That's awesome. And, you know, I, it, being a native of the Chicagoland area, you know, yeah. I would, you wouldn't think of some of the smaller town areas as well that become, you know, these little known hubs and these spots, especially along the riverbanks where these traditions have passed along and, you know, have, you know, as you, I think you had mentioned um, about like the steamboats traveling up and down the river yeah. as well. Well, you know, when I was uh, documenting this music, I was in Beardstown and interviewed uh, someone in, uh, whose name I, I don't remember at the moment. But they were talking about how in the 1880s, their family would get on the packet steamboat and go down to St. Louis for the weekend. And they would buy up all the summer's provisions and the seed and such. And, and I was really kind of struck by that because it never occurred to me that people would be so fluid uh, and, and go from one place to another as casually as we do today. But the steamboats and then eventually the railroads, they were vast uh, connecting uh, systems with, that would take you anywhere. And folks really did go up and down that river uh, a lot more than even I recognized. It, it made a huge difference. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I can only I'm gonna, imagine. I'm take just a minute, Jeremy, and I'm going to grab the chair and switch uh, the camera shot so I can actually look at you when I'm talking to you. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. We'll show folks how we make sausage. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and one of the things um, that I just kind of wanted to, to think about as well is, you know, we think about nowadays traveling to St. Louis, you know, and how where I'm sitting in Jacksonville, you know, it takes hour and a half, two hours, and you're yeah. in St. Louis. Whereas, you know, back in the 1800s, even the early 1900s, that trip was a lot more extensive and there was a lot more influence of people you met and stories that you may have picked up because, yeah. because of that travel time. Yeah, and those, those waterways, they literally were the super highways of the day. You know, the story of Illinois is not so much a story of it being settled as it being settled and then people moving on to other locations and new people coming in and replacing them. There's a constant changeover of, of people and, and ideas and such in our state. Uh, maybe more than many other states, uh, at least as far as I can tell. And that really plays into the music and the, the culture, especially of these little river towns, because the river towns are the biggest communities as our state is developing. Uh, we don't really uh, get much beyond the rivers until we start to incorporate a system of roadways and then eventually hard roads and automobiles then it's a whole new game. Absolutely. Um, I, I feel like, uh, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that's kind of why uh, I remembered reading something in the past about uh, the, the town of Forgatonia in Western Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think you mean the kingdom of Forgatonia, the, the independent <laughs> nation. Um, so that's actually a pretty interesting backstory, and, and I'll take a little tangent here to explain this to you. Uh, Western Illinois has been plagued for years with a lack of support with tax dollars. And uh, in the early 1970s, uh, some of the politically active folks at the time decided that they would, uh, they would create the independent nation of Forgotonia. They would secede from the Union they would immediately declare war on the United States and then just as quickly surrender and then apply for foreign aid. <laughs> and it was nothing more than political theater, but it worked. 
They were written up in Life magazine. They were on the national news. And when I first came to West Central Illinois out of college in 1976, I was part of the first national money coming in. I was doing archaeology for what would become the Kansas City Chicago Expressway. So that's that's Forgottonia for you. Yeah, and I, I'll be honest, the first time I heard of that was actually on a History Channel special. <laughs> so <There you> a <laughs> national, national media. Um, but, you know, it makes me think, and, and one of the things they talked about specifically with that section of the state was just the way that the railroads kind of passed by it as well. They went above and they went below it, but they didn't go th through it. And so, you know, I, I think of areas around the country too and you think about all these hubs that just come into illinois and the amount of people that were coming here and bringing those stories with you and and like you you know one of the interesting ones that that is always amazing to hear about is you know that uh th this the gentleman you spoke to about the titanic and just oh, yeah, the history that he had um mm -hmm. you know and i can only imagine the other stories that he told you that <laughs> Lawrence told me a story, um, which I love to share. Uh, he went to a one-room schoolhouse outside of Bader when he was a young man called the Union Schoolhouse. And, uh, and he mentioned that when he was a young boy, the word came out that the U.S. Geological Survey was going to be coming to that particular section around Bader, Illinois, and doing their survey on a specific date. And that was a big deal. And uh, so a bunch of boys got together the night before they were coming, and they decided they would pull a prank. And they went out late at night. They borrowed a local farmer's ladder, climbed up to the front of the schoolhouse with that ladder, and where it was painted Union, they took a paintbrush and they just painted a little arch over the U, changing the word Union to Onion. And uh, I thought that was a really funny story. Later that night, after I, after I interviewed him, I went home and I happened to have the latest U.S. Geological Survey map of that very area. And I opened that map up and to this very day, it says Onion Schoolhouse on that map. <laughs> <laughs> that little piece of history that's going to live on well, for who knows how long. <laughs> and, you know, it's the idea that people, how they interacted, how they, I mean, these are no different than, than kids pulling pranks today. Um, much like that song, When Katie Comes Down to the Gate. You know, kids today are the same as they were then. And these stories help illustrate how much we still have in common with the people that got us here. And, and mm -hmm. where a lot of the, the, the traditions and, and things that we do come from. Uh, to me, it's just a, a wealth of cultural richness that, that we're able to share and preserve you know, that just makes our section of Illinois that much richer. Absolutely. Now, I, I want to ask a educational question here. Yeah. And that is on the side of if we have someone who's wanting to learn more about, you know, the, the history of Illinois music and a lot of the topics that you've talked about and, you know, to be able to help pass these stories along, how would you recommend someone get into that? Um, there are a number of ways to do it. Uh, there are many published stories and uh, books about music in Illinois. Um, but I will tell you that the entire set of recordings that I made in the 1970s, um, they are currently archived at the Western Illinois University Special Collections uh, section. People can actually go in and listen to these tapes. All the tapes were transcribed into a document so you can read the text. Um, that's a great way to do it. Uh, another way, in a more general sense, is that the Library of Congress has a tremendous amount of this material now digitized and on their website. And the master tapes from that, from the Skylar Arts Project, actually were accepted into the, to the Library of Congress collection. Um, wow. So there are resources out there now uh, online, um, both locally, regionally, and nationally. Uh, that can give you all kinds of information about this. Um, there's even a, a website in California where they have digitized the earliest um, Edison cylinder recordings. And one of the songs that I didn't get to do today but was very popular in this section uh, of Illinois was an old tune called The Preacher and the Bear. 
and I actually found a recording that had been made of that song on an Edison wax cylinder at that website. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty incredible to touch that time and that place. And I think music can do it in a way that's almost almost visceral, you know, whereas just having, a, you know, a lecture or, or a book doesn't quite get the same effect. But you can Absolutely. hear how the tempo of the music reflects the, you know, the pace of life back. So. Absolutely. Well, um, I want to uh, before I kind of do a, clo a little wrap up here because um, we've had we've had you for plenty of time tonight, Chris, and I really appreciate oh, everything you've been pleasure. able to provide for for us and our listeners. Um, and uh, I just wanted you uh, to ask you too as well if if people want to want to hear more from you or they want to see a show from you, um, obviously we can go to your website, chrisvalillo.com. Um, yeah. Do you have anything special coming up that you would like them to maybe join you for? Um, two things. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock p.m., I will do uh, a, not the same show, but, but along the same lines, but it's actually focused on historic instruments of Illinois. So I'll have that Larson guitar out there and I'll have an 1898 Washburn. Um, and I will talk about that time when Illinois was so focused, you know, and, and the national center, world center for that matter, of string musical instruments. Um, that I'll have on my uh, Facebook page and on my YouTube channel. That'll be streamed live at 2 o'clock. And then Saturday at 7 o'clock, um, I... I host and produce a, a musical series of my own called Hickory Ridge Concerts. And uh, we'll have that show at 7 o'clock p.m. And I'm trying to think who the guest is because I've got all these other shows in my head right now. <laughs> oh, oh, this is actually a great guest. Uh, his name is Dennis Stroma. And what a lot of folks may not realize is that in Illinois, we have a rich tradition of French Cajun music. Because as the Acadians traveled from Canada down to New Orleans, Many of them stopped in uh, southern Illinois and in Missouri, and many of those settlements still exist. Dennis has collected and documented that, and then he's also a great Western swing uh, fiddle player. So he'll be on, on that performance as well. All of them are free. You can go to YouTube, uh, Chris Belillo's YouTube channel, or um, the Chris Belillo Music Facebook page, and I'll have those uh, up there. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, am, I would be... Uh surprised if you know if i had talked to anyone and they said yes we knew you know the french cajun connections of illinois uh, <laughs> goes back to that same thing you know it's this blending of different peoples and it's this blending of different sources and musics and such that is what illinois is all about we are the melting pot of the country it's that absolutely simple. Absolutely. Well, um, before I say goodnight to Chris um, and, and thank you again for joining us, um, I do just want to make one pitch uh, for the Illinois College Fine Arts Series final event of the year, um, which is coming up on Saturday, April 17th at 7.30 p.m. Um, we will actually be live again, uh, and we are going to be joined by some members of the Stan Kenton Legacy Orchestra. Uh, we'll actually be showing some videos, uh, video clips from all the years that we can find uh, of the Stan Kitten Orchestra and the Stan Kitten Legacy Orchestra, and then speaking with um, several members, uh, including Mike Vax, uh, who is one of the trumpeters, and um, I think he, he's been performing <laughs> um, with this group for as, as long as I've known, um, and he's actually... Uh, he's, Garrett Allman is going to be joining us live as well, and it's going to be a wonderful event, a wonderful evening of music, um, and just some live fun conversations as well. Um, so I do want to thank Chris Valillo again for joining us tonight. Um, it was a wonderful program. We are so excited we were able to bring you, and I know um, from all of us on the Illinois College Fine Arts Series board, we hope to be able to bring you live uh, to Illinois College uh, in the near future <laughs> and bring this music to a live audience again. But as Chris mentioned, um, you please check out his Facebook, his YouTube page, um, chrisvalillo.com, and stay up to date on, what, on all things Illinois College Fine Arts by joining us at ic.edu backslash FAS. Um, we look forward to... Oh, go ahead, Chris. 
let me add my thanks to the uh, to the fine arts series. This is so critically important to our region, and uh, uh, I got a tip of the hat to Illinois College for taking the the leap of faith to begin to do these live stream presentations, so we can stay connected, even in these difficult times. Absolutely, and and I will make a pitch from both myself um, the. The Fine Arts Series and Chris Villillo, um, that if you would like to help donate and support all the wonderful arts programming yes. that's being offered, um, please visit our websites and please, please uh, add your monetary support. Um, it's with your help that we are able to continue to provide programs like this. And it's with wonderful um, artists like Chris that we're able to bring to you uh, live in your living room. <laughs> a wonderful show as well so <laughs> but one, once again thank you so much chris for joining us tonight um and thank you everyone for watching um and i, I hope you have a wonderful evening or rest of the day if you're watching this tomorrow morning <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you everyone good night